Hey guys, Armin Gun here today with your daily dose of gun education. But first, can we take a moment to appreciate just how friggin' good the GM6 Lynx looks with an HK dual optic on it. Anyways, I do digress. Today's video is gonna be a fun one. Probably somewhat obvious, this video was inspired by the new movie Bullet Train, which my wife and I recently saw on our last date night. We loved it. It was honestly super fun. Brad Pitt's hair was goals. Um, seriously has me thinking of growing mine out again. You just never get past the awkward stage. Plenty of sweet, sweet action, including a lot of fun hand-to-hand -hand stuff with various improvised melee weapons, lots of British accents, and some pretty heckin' cool guns, to be honest. Um, really, overall, they did a not bad job using guns, in my opinion, but it could have been better. Way better! And I'll elaborate um, in my own fun way, basically taking you guys through a journey of the three best guns for a bullet train heist. I'll quickly run through the contents and structure of the video. Uh, feel free to jump around via the timeline below or in the description. Everything's got labels there. But we're going to kick things off with me giving you a quick summary of the firearm-based action in the film and my self-proclaimed professional critique on it. Then I'll run through my top three guns that I think would have been best suited for a similar heist on a bullet train. I'll give a few plugs to the cool cats that support this channel. And I'll close with another healthy dose of gun culture via a... Uh, gun pill. Let's get into it. But first, our 15 second sponsor. Shout out to Right to Bear Insurance. For many of you, guns are about protecting yourself and your family. But what happens after you have to do that? Especially in today's day and age, your actions can be called into question and it is nice, really nice, to know there is a ton of legal support behind you. It's super affordable guys and to be honest, for the peace of mind, it's worth it. I myself have carried this type of insurance for five years now. Better yet, supporting them supports us. Affiliate link in the description below. Without offering much for spoilers, I'll simply don my unofficial title of the internet's gun snob and comment on some huge oversights these guys made with guns. And what I would have used instead, because there were plenty of opportunities to use both more epic and more practical slash realistic guns in the movie. And don't worry, I'm gonna back up all my choices with healthy doses of gun education. So let's set the scene. This is their scene, by the way. I mean, why not? They made a whole freaking movie about it. So it probably makes sense to uh, go by go by that. So it's a snatch and grab job on a train. Uh, the dude, Brad Pitt, is basically going in to steal a package from some existing shady and likely armed passengers, then piecing out. At least that's the plan. But it's a movie, so obviously it doesn't go to plan. What does his dispatch leave him? A friggin' Glock. A nicely modded out Glock at that, um, but full size and no threaded barrel. Big rookie move, if you catch my drift. Silencer no bueno. When he eventually meets up with the two cool cucumbers he's supposedly stealing from, they're also armed uh, similarly boringly. There are some shootouts within the train with handguns, which makes sense for reasons that I'll get into. Uh, then some extra baddies come into play later on, mostly equipped with SMGs, which according to Nine Hole Reviews would fall under their Type 3. PDW, by their definition, is a miniaturized version of a full-size SMG. And again, I'll get into it, but using guns like that in this scenario does make a lot of sense. And then there was like one dude with an AK, but uh, there's always one dude with an AK, so we'll, we'll give him that. Again, gun usage overall, pretty smart. Just, again, overall, really basic. They just left a lot of room for me to come in with a healthy dose of realism and practicality to share some truly epic guns that both the gun aficionados and the lame sauce antis would appreciate. Now to throw those guys a bone, a couple highlights that they did uh, that were actually really cool and realistic. So in one scene, there's a dude, again, without giving away any spoilers, this is just a cool thing they did. They used not a Beretta, but a gun that's basically identical to the Beretta in a really cool scene where the dude loaded it, chambered around um, off of a table. I rewatched this in half speed and yes, there was no Hollywood trickery afoot. They actually did it. And a round even went, while well, round was, hmm. I might need to rewatch again if there was actually a round in the chamber or if they just, it actually chambered a realistic looking one. Insert cheesy Arnold Schwarzenegger reference here. Guys, we're back. Happy to report that they did in fact do it properly. They had a fake round that looked real go into the chamber when, uh, when they did it. And you can't, you can't push off the barrel of the chamber. You have to catch this front lip here, which the other gun did as well, but I'll demonstrate. Catch that front lip, push down, and you chamber a whole thing. Anyways, cool stuff, good job, props master slash movie armor. The next time use a Beretta, they're just cooler. 
Now what I'm glad they didn't do is uh, run around with a bunch of 416s. SIG 553s, AKS 74Us, and the other common SBRs used typically as Hollywood fodder. Because while I love and preach me some SBRs, uh, the inside of a moving train filled with passengers um, is just not the place. And for even more reasons. Noise, obviously. But if you've ever fired an SBR, even in an indoor range, you'll know for firsthand how brain rattling the concussion is from firing a supersonic rifle cartridge, literally going two to two and a half times the speed of sound out of a barrel less than half the length uh, that it was designed for, feels like. Even with Ear Pro, which of course they aren't wearing in Hollywood, uh, the blasts would be pretty disorienting. The flash would also be pretty intense in some of the more dimly lit cars. Even throwing a can on it may not be the best case scenario. Oh, it, it might have some benefits, which are interesting and I thought of randomly. Uh, I'll get into that later, in, well, in a bit. But anyways, with these high-powered rounds that are capable of quite a bit of penetration, well, collateral damage is another biggie to consider here. When you've got these, uh, again, high-powered supersonic rifle rounds in play, and cars full of innocent bystanders, eh, probably not the best mix. And again, I'm saying this because that's where this movie did well. Kudos again to the team for resisting the urge to use the cool guy, usual suspects here. Also, one more note of praise, the uh, baddies with the SMGs that came on later, or the miniature SMGs, the Type 3 PDWs, they were mostly MP5Ks, which that was an awesome choice. Very compact, maneuverable in a nice tight space. We're gonna get into that too. That's important. But yeah, the MP5K is probably one of the best choices. Not the best because I'm gonna shatter that a little bit here with not one, but two, but maybe even more. We'll leave it to you guys for the rest. But I got two options that are better, but still very good. I think I saw full-size MPX too, when it should have been the K. This thing is awesome. 4.5 inches of 9mm barrel is all you need, but hey, at least they didn't go full schlong and use the 16-inch MPX that they did in John Wick 3. I'm still mad about that, you guys. And people still comment in the little short I did where I criticize this. Um, people are always saying more velocity is more lethality, and that's why it was good. And that's not true, and I've answered lots of comments, so if you're interested, you can go check that out. But basically, John Wick 3 sold out and it was not realistic and that's largely why I started doing these videos in the first place. It's because for a movie that takes so much of gun realism to heart, I mean, they, they overdo a lot of things, but it's all in it's all in good fun, at least that stuff. But they give a highly trained dude, the guy that's supposed to be really good with guns, who's been given guns by supposedly experts in their fancy little armories, and they tout this 16 inch, nine millimeter semi-automatic gun. My word if that isn't stupid. Knowing full well he's going to a whole bunch of CQB environments, man, I just want to, I just want to rag about it on the internet to tell you guys. Anyways, this is a tangent. Read the comments. You'll see mine. Yeah, stating my opinion. I'll link the one minute short up here, but honestly, that might be worth going through again because one minute was not enough time to truly explore the depths of their dismal use of that gun in that movie. But I digress. Fun parts coming up next. Mm hmm. But first, a word from our second feature partner, Rhino Freaking Metals. These guys make rank cool safes. I have two of them and their tool chest, which I've also done a whole video of using for basically gun stuff. And uh, it's a lot of fun. But the cool thing I wanna show you today is this swing out rack. My buddy who works in marketing over there, the director of marketing, Chill Sergeant Luke, recently swung himself out. He's a, he's a big dude, guessing 220-ish. He swung out on a rack from the safe. It was glorious. Check out their social media, Instagram. It was great. But that thing is a lifesaver because you get 13 guns on here and you can swing it open and access all the stuff on the back. Did I mention there's a freaking MG34 up the side? All right, time for my picks. So if I were Brad, well, I would have never left Jen. <laughs> totally relevant, but that just needed to be said. Um, but in the context of this film, um, or rather his handler, what I would have supplied him for this mission, should he choose to accept it. Ooh, by the way, Mission Impossible is coming out pretty soon. Should be some more fun guns in that one to pick apart. It's Hollywood, so there'll be some mistakes. Anyways, that's another tangent. What I would have done, what I would have supplied him with, would have been the following. For three guns, let's look at three, the three most critical elements that he's gonna be facing on this mission. First and foremost, being discreet. You don't want things to devolve into a firefight. Obviously, you want to get things through nice, Cool cucumber, inconspicuously, be in and be out. Didn't even know you were there. Well, they, they'll know you're there when you stole their stuff, but 
hopefully not until you're long gone. However, that would make for a boring movie, so count on violence. But that doesn't mean you can't take advantage of some sneaky deaky secret squirrel stuff to begin with. Then inevitably, once cover is blown, you're gonna want a lot of firepower with the least concern of collateral damage, both to yourself by way of concussion, and of course others by way of getting shot. You also want this piece to be concealable on your person, is uh, the angle I'm gonna be taking. And all the while, you need to be aware that this is a super CQB environment. It's inside of a freaking train, for goodness sake. So that in itself has a number of other factors at play, such as, and you'll see this in the movie, uh, the potential for hand-to-hand -hand combat and or having your firearm wrestled away from you. So for example, you might not want to have a long rifle because of this. It's got plenty of room for someone to grab a hold of it and, uh, you know, a big chunky buttstock or a long rail or even a friggin' grip that someone can just get a hold of and, uh, well, guns are dangerous, but never more so when in your enemy's hands pointed at you. Now, while I clearly advocated for something like a suppressor up above when I was talking about noise and concussion, you could also argue that that would make your rifle or firearm, pistol even, inadvertently long and potentially unnecessarily long. And once again, give your opponent something to grab a hold of and uh, rip it away from you guys. But I'll counter with the fact that you can probably get a few shots off before your adversary closes in to uh, can grabbing, <laughs> can grabbing distance, at which point it should be nice and toasty. So imagine this, you're in this train, taking shots at this dude as he's getting closer and closer to you, somehow magically avoiding all your shots, at which time he closes right in, grips your tube, pause camera, insert sounds of skin sizzling, cut to the adversary's face, mainly his eyes as they bulge wide and anger turns to pain and surprise, and then he falls down in pain and pulls the old Peter Griffin, ah, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> that would actually be pretty, pretty cool. So anyway, Hollywood, you're welcome. There's a freebie for you. Or if you want to send me a royalty check, you can find my email. My email is out there. Anyways, that's more or less the uh, overall gambit of issues I think you're going to be facing within the context of a bullet train heist. So next, let's look at the tools we use to address them. First up, discretion. Um, now, I don't have this, unfortunately, to show you, so I'll just throw in a couple pictures here and there. But it's the uh, B&T Station 6. This thing is crazy quiet, potentially the quietest gun uh, available. It was actually designed for veterinarian slash humanely dispatching um, injured or sick wildlife near public areas. Basically, you can walk. It's it's a pistol. It operates off a bolt action principle. It has a ported barrel, which will naturally make supersonic ammunition subsonic. It's fitted with a suppressor, and I believe there's optional wipes as well, which aren't very durable and they don't contribute to accuracy. But this is basically a point blank, a very quiet dispatching tool. Dispatching. Definition of euphemism, right there. And then also, it, as it acts on a very manual cycling action, it's like a bolt action, um, you don't get the noise of a cycling action, which, for those of you who do shoot Hollywood quiet guns, will know that the action is still more or less the loudest part of the gun at that point. You still have in a semi-automatic or automatic action, you have the bolt carry group slamming back and forth, very quickly cycling to chamber a fresh round each time. So this eliminates that. Now, in a shootout, this would be an awful choice. But given the goal of infiltrating and hopefully stealing the case unnoticed, they should have at least tried this. I think it would have been smart. It's what realistically you would do. In the real world, which Hollywood, I mean, obviously this isn't a real world scenario, but you're going for some elements of realism to have a semi-believable story. So this would, uh, this would be the way to do that. So there you go. First and foremost, give them the capability to silently dispatch a foe without alerting any fellow passengers or adversaries. Gun two and three both assume your cover is blown and you're probably not gonna have any ear pro with you. Well, maybe you will. Um, your little earpiece, whatever. They're using to communicate with your outside handler or whatever could, could have an active hearing safe thing in there. But regardless, uh, you might at least want the option for a suppressor. So at least in these next two, I would have a muzzle device capable of accepting a suppressor or silencer. Technically silencer, but just like technically Garand is the proper pronunciation for this, not Garand. Um, well, check the comments below. I'm sure people will be freaking out and uh, arguing for grand. But if they say grand, you just make fun of those people. Anyways, once your cover is blown, suppressor on or off, NBD, I'm gonna say you want fast firepower in two sizes, extra small and small. First off, you're gonna want something concealable and carryable on your person. So you're gonna probably want a handgun, appendix carrier, or something like that, that accepts, in my opinion, double stack mags. Again, you want fast, you want fast firepower. You want some good capacity as well. I'd say something like a Glock 19 or the Zev OZ9-C. Those are both gonna be awesome options. And also I highly recommend a red dot sight because this is gonna be very like fast, almost point blank style of fighting. 
you're not going to have time to line up sites. But with training, you can be very fast with a red dot at site acquisition. So I would uh, highly recommend that. Now my third pick, this is where it starts to get Hollywood fun. When you slip onto the train, obviously you can have a little backpack or side satchel or something, and it's gonna be just the right size to conceal the next firearm. Now the firearm may not be on you at all times, it may not be as quick to access as your concealed carry sidearm, but this is where things are going to hell in a handbasket and you really need to up the ante on your side. You need to become a one-man army. Now in the movie, again, they use the MP5K, which is an awesome choice. Nine mil, it's not gonna go through a bunch of barriers and kill a bunch of unsuspecting passengers in other cabins. It is suppressible with a quick little Trilock HK dealie out front, but you can do better. In the modern era, body armor is very common. You can easily slip something like this little slick plate carrier underneath your everyday clothes. No one would even notice. And once again, the movie did make use of body armor. So at least they were thinking about it. But both Brad Pitt and all the baddies realistically should have had body armor on. So you should go in with that assumption. Now, spraying and praying in a small, tight little confined area like a bullet train fuselage. Is that what you, I don't know if that's what you call it, but it sounds right. Um, chances are you're going to hit someone somewhere else anyways. But you never know. Your vitals and the, the butt's going to take you down is mostly in there unless they peg it in the face. In which case, may I suggest the Ronin by DevTech full ballistic helmet. Rated to stop a 44 Magnum. But if that's not your jam, then at least throw on some body armor. And then at least have a gun that can probably, maybe, defeat it. So for me, what would I have in uh, Brad Pitt's little uh, side bag there ready to go? A Type 1 purpose built PDW, namely the P90 or the MP7. Now, those guns in particular, in the height of the Cold War, were designed for rear echelon troops and whatnot in case. These Soviets paratrooped into uh, Western Europe. They had their fan-dangled body armor back then, which would apparently stopped nine millimeter. So the Western powers were hot to design something that could counteract it. Now, while us normies can have trouble getting these specific armor penetrating rounds for those guns, I'm sure it's no stretch to see them in Hollywoodized situations. Better yet, these guns are super compact and they're very high capacity. The MP7 is gonna get you 40, the P90 is gonna get you 50, and all in the same form factor of the gun itself. I had the pleasure of shooting both of these at Battlefield Vegas in full auto. And for me personally, it would be the P90. And yes, some concern for passengers and, and collateral damage, but the rounds are very small. Here we can look at the 5.7 by 28 millimeter, the P90 round, next to a 5.56, and you can see this is very tiny. Might penetrate the body armor on the baddies, but probably isn't going to do a whole lot outside of that. And the 4.6 that the MP7 uses is very similar. And with that small and light of animal, you can carry a ton of it with you, making your one-man army character that much more believable. Now as a bonus gun here, honorable mention goes to something much less practical, but uh, super freaking cool. The Fostec Origin 12 shotgun, short barrel of course, which is known as the fastest shotgun in the world. Of course, complete with the Osprey 12 suppressor, Man, Hollywood eat your heart out. You'd have a slightly wider spread with buckshot than you'd have with a typical rifle, uh, which could make taking down, you know, body armor or non-body armor guys a little easier. Chance of a you know, hip shot or something like that. Leg shot, shoot him in the leg. Uh, but I would like to take this moment to say that once again, shotguns don't spread as much people think or Hollywood thinks. So uh, be careful with that. Do some testing in advance so you know what the realistic spread of your round is going to be at the distance you're going to be discharging it at. And again, the rounds wouldn't be a huge deal for collateral damage, and also the right rounds would have been fairly quiet as well. The shotgun ammo was already pretty near the threshold of the sound barrier. So there you go. Were I responsible for playing G.I. Joe's on set, I would have made use of uh, these those types of guns, essentially. Now I ask of you, you fine purveyors of Les Pew, what would you use? I think I established a pretty good framework for looking at this type of situation and perhaps evaluating others. And I'm sure there are lots of examples that would work within the examples I gave. So you can let me know what your top threes would have been. A stealthy dispatch weapon, a concealable sidearm with capacity to spare, and a PDW that packs a punch. Or you could disagree with my loadout entirely. And uh, if you do, please tell me why. I'm always looking to learn. And you'd be surprised amidst the slurry of trolls, there is the odd gem of truth. But nonetheless, explain your reasoning and let me know what yours would be. Anyways, that's it. Save for the gun pill at the sign-off, so stay tuned for that. Otherwise, I bid you adieu. Armored Gun, out.
Boom diggity. Shout out to both the third and fourth feature partners of today's show. We have first Cold Harbor Supply, a night vision thermal and IR specialist. They ship internationally. Code Arm and Gun saves you 5%. You were kind enough to loan me this set of Photonus Echo tubes. KDX mount. Beautiful. Also a loan from them is this cool little infrared uh, thermal, which we need to play with some more. They don't sell any guns, so YouTube, don't get mad at me. Also, Armament Tech for their awesome hunting and target optics. Again, YouTube should be friendly. I have selflessly shilled for these guys for freaking five years. Actually, just, I have loved their optics. I bought a bunch and they were just my go-to optic for lots of different systems. And I've loved them for a long time. And recently they have created an affiliate program. So I thought, yes, my years of patriotic patronage may finally pay off. So if you guys want to support that, if you want to pick up them and support the channel in the process, affiliate link in the description below. All right, guys, gun pill time. This is technically the second gun pill for the channel. This video here will take you back to the first one. But here we go. Gun pill number two. Gun pills are the great deterrent. Now, of course, is the old adage of an armed society is a polite society. Uh, but I like to think of that in terms of civilian legal concealed carry. I'm certainly a proponent of it. And uh, I actually came up with a little story a long time ago that I used to rationalize it to myself and that I've told many people when discussing the context or the concept of civilian legal carry, especially concealed carry, and, and advocating for it. So I'll share that little story with you right now. Now the story is basically a bank robbery and it takes place out of a couple different scenarios. Now essentially you just imagine yourself in a bank, a traditional nice bank. There's a couple armed security guards, there's some tellers up front, there's people in queue, walking in and out, going to the ATM, whatever. It's a, it's a happening place. But there's about to be a robbery. Now, the important thing to, to look at this story is through two different lenses or two different contexts. In one, the bank is in an area where there's constitutional carry or concealed carry, whatever. There's just civilians that can have concealed firearms. Scenario two is a gun-free zone or otherwise in an area where civilian carry is not legal. Now we're looking at this again as the overall viewpoint that guns are the great deterrent. But it's also more than that, and this is a great one for your anti-gun or fence-sitting friends. Anyways, first off, from the robber's perspective. Now, in the scenario two, where there's no chance of civilians carrying firearms, I mean, unless the, the, the context was a gun-free zone, but in a constitutional carry area, in which case, there's probably gonna be some people that have them anyways, because the constitution, which doesn't apply to me, hashtag sad face. Anyways, they're gonna assume no civilian guns. So basically, the robber can come in before the, the actual crime, case the place out, take note of how many guards there are, and plan accordingly. Also taking note of typical police response times in the area. Now the law is always there. It should provide its own deterrent, but sometimes it's not enough. I mean, there are still bank robberies in places where it's illegal to rob banks. And it's always important to know that the criminals will always have the element of surprise. They get to make the first move and they're unknown to everyone until they do so. Whereas the good guys, the armed cops or the armed security guards or the unarmed security guards, um, they're right there, plain as day, wearing a little badge that says security. So the would-be robber can march right in, do what they want to do, and uh, make off with a load of cash. I mean, assuming everything goes well. Anyways, that's scenario two. Scenario one, they basically can't plan. They basically can't ever assume that they're going to be the only guns in the building once they've dealt with the known guns, which are the guards. Because as once again, we saw with the uh, Good Samaritan of the Greenwood Mall, a random civilian who is more likely than not going to be taking it seriously and have proper training, which he did. Again, he was able to drop the baddie from across the room within like 30 seconds of him uh, going full garbage human. So now with that done, um, you next ask the person to take the perspective of a person in the bank. They don't have to be a person that's got a concealed carry gun. They just have to imagine themselves in the same the same story or situation uh, with both scenarios. So first of all, gun, gun free zone, no guns. You're basically at the mercy of the robbers until the cops show up, um, which as we all know, can take a while. And sometimes they don't even do stuff when they get there. And I'll see the opportunity to say that uh, once again, we have a, a situation where we're protecting money and government and things of that nature with guns, but we argue that it's not good to protect the most important things with gun. Uh, uh, anyways, tangent. Relevant tangent, but tangent. So their person, the sole mercy of them, they could be used as a hostage, whatever. Um, best case scenario is they just, the banker does their thing. They get out, they get taken out by cops somewhere else and your life goes on. But in scenario one, 
there could be any number of concealed carry people in that crowd. Would you feel better then as the rando non-carrying normie in the context with no guns or the context with guns? Again, given light to the recent Greenwood Good Samaritan. And to tie that all up, guns are the great deterrent because it just makes crime way more dangerous to carry out because you can't control the unknowns. And what you don't know is scary. Anyways, there you guys go. Gun pill number two, guns are the great deterrent. Share it with your friends who are not quite sure that guns are for them or for people in general, because bit by bit, we will take back the culture. Reminder, merch is coming from Bunker Branding Co. soon. So get ready for that boom diggity and gun pill tease.